to San Francisco for the 133rd INTA annual meeting. This great city of the American West is an ideal venue for INTA. It includes everything you could possibly want, great food, exceptional culture and art, entertainment and sports. So I hope you have some time to go out and enjoy the city. We have almost 9,000 attendees from 136 countries. And the international dimension of the meeting is really its most impressive feature. We are honored to have representatives from the Japan Patent Office and from INTA members based in Japan. The world is filled with troubles, but the events in Japan, the loss of life and property from the earthquake and tsunami, followed by the international rescue efforts, and then the heroic efforts to prevent a meltdown at the damaged nuclear reactors have saddened and inspired all of us. Let me thank the 2011 annual meeting co-chairs, Dana Gillen from Diageo North America, <coughs> and Max Kinkeldye from Grunecker, Kinkeldye, Stockmare, and Schwanhausen. What a great job they have done working with their outstanding project team and INTA staff member Sarah Burke to put together this excellent three-day educational program. And Sarah was simultaneously planning her wedding and honeymoon. <laughs> so while I thank Sarah Burke for her earlier contributions, you can now thank Sarah O'Connell as you see this program roll out. <laughs> Attend as many sessions as you can. You will leave San Francisco with up-to-date information and new, new insights that you can apply on behalf of your clients as soon as you return home. Dana is not able to join us today, but Max will be on stage in a moment to introduce the program and our distinguished keynote speaker. He will also tell you about a few new features that we developed this year to enhance your annual meeting experience. As any of you who have been involved with the annual meeting in the past can attest, the planning for this meeting is extremely complex and the execution on site a challenge. I want to thank the entire INTA staff, each of whom contributed significantly to the success of this meeting. Whether it's Tricia Simpson and Stuart Ruff who handle the logistics, Paula Lee who works on site and throughout the year with our exhibitors and sponsors, Steve Merzon and his staff handling our technology needs, Lisa Hutchinson and her staff putting in long hours at the registration desk, Jessica Takero working with the increasing number of reporters and bloggers who cover this event, or the committee liaisons who are rushing from one committee meeting to the next. While the annual meeting could not happen without the more than 300 speakers, moderators, and planners who have contributed their expertise to the educational program, these individuals are just a small part of the 2,500 volunteers serving on committees and project teams and contributing to our publications. And speaking of the committees, we are preparing for committee selection for the 2012-13 committee term. The process begins June 1. The application form will be on the website for 30 days. As always, there will be many more applicants than committee slots. But go to the website in June, give us your preferences, and we will place as many people as possible. The enthusiasm of the volunteers and the quality of the work they produce remain a defining feature of INTA. It is their efforts in cooperation with the staff that have produced the signal accomplishments of the association. But before I tell you of the association's gains since the last annual meeting, let me speak about our greatest loss. As most of you know, Daryl Gressich, INTA's Director of Marketing and Program Strategy, died suddenly of heart failure on February 2nd of this year. The magnitude of our loss is apparent to all of you who are engaged in committee work. Those of you who are involved with the association only at the time of the annual meeting may not be able to appreciate how much talent, dedication, <coughs> initiative, friendliness, and humor are now missing from our office and from our work. Daryl started with INTA on January 1, 2002, and his nine years of service were filled with many successes. He was a mentor to the younger staff members he hired and trained, and he maintained warm friendships with so many of the volunteers that the sadness of his passing was felt throughout the world. 
As I touch on INTA's progress on the past year, please remember that Daryl was a major contributor to it. We now have almost 5,800 member companies and firms from more than 190 countries, an increase from last year. Our academic memberships also keep growing. We now have more than 350 students and more than 100 professors. INTA's anti-counterfeiting efforts continue to expand with our leadership on the steering group for the sixth Global Congress on Con Combating Counterfeiting and Piracy, which took place in Paris earlier this year, and our advocacy on behalf of ACTA, the proposed anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. As many of you know, INTA has been focused on ICANN's plans to expand the GTLD space. Through the Internet Committee, I, INTA has submitted extremely detailed comments on all aspects of this proposal. We added to that production with comments on the current version of the applicant guidebook filed just this last Saturday. And we do this while at the same time arguing before Congress, at public forums, and in the comments to ICANN that the expansion of the GTLD space without sufficient protection for trademarks creates very significant hardships for brand owners and dangers for consumers. We opened a new office in Washington, D.C. and hired David War, an experienced and well-known expert in the federal legislative process. David, who also has extensive international experience, will run the D.C. office, which we expect will grow along with our offices in Shanghai and Brussels. Our engagement in jurisdictions throughout the world continues to increase. In addition to the United States, China, and the EU, where INTA continues, along with four European associations, to be an observer to the OHIM Administrative Board and Budget Committee meetings. And I want to thank former INTA board member Gabriel olson Scalin from IKEA for being INTA's representatives to those meetings. We have recently been active in India, Latin America, and a number of other important jurisdictions. This activity is reflected in the fact that representatives from more than 30 governments and associations are with us in San Francisco. At this annual meeting, we are celebrating a milestone in the history of the association, the publication of the 100th anniversary issue of the Trademark Report. The volume contains reflections from 17 past editors-in-chief and a series of thought-provoking articles that have generated interest and controversy. You will recognize the former editors-in-chief by their distinctive orange ribbon, so when you see them, thank them for their contribution. And try to attend Tuesday's TMR anniversary session with a distinguished panel moderated by J. Thomas McCarthy. INTA unveiled a brand new website on January 6th that is an improvement on the old site in every respect, design, navigation, and content. We introduced a new slogan, Powerful Network, Powerful Brands, that captures who we are and explains in four words why membership in INTA is so attractive. By now you've all seen the landing page of the website, the rotating cubes with pictures and corporate logos, and it's never too late for you to add your picture or your company's logo to the website. We have increased the content since the January launch and will continue to do so making the INTA website the most useful and comprehensive tool for trademark professionals. And as part of this initiative, we launched the trademark industry's largest online community, My Powerful Network, a secure platform for INTA members to communicate and exchange information and to extend the INTA networking experience beyond our meetings and our committee work. New contacts and friends are being made on My Powerful Network every day through the many groups and blogs that have been created and managed by users from around the world. We've been able to accomplish this and much more while maintaining the financial health of the association, as our outside auditors Loeb and Troper confirmed to the Board of Directors Saturday at its meeting. In 2010, we had a substantial improvement over budget, and the investment portfolio earned a good return, contributing to the outstanding financial results. Everyone involved is to be congratulated on the progress of the association. It is now my privilege to introduce the key contributor, INTA's 2011 President Gerhard Bauer, the Chief Trademark Counsel for Daimler AG in Stuttgart, Germany. Gerhard became President on January 1 after a year as President-elect and many years of service to INTA as Vice President, Treasurer, 
chair of the planning committee of the board, and in a host of other positions. In his remarks, Gerhard will expand on some of the topics that I have only mentioned, and will give you a look at the issues that have engaged him and the board thus far in 2011. Gerhard, who was on the road constantly for Daimler, somehow managed to come to New York for INTA's first board meeting of 2011 to represent INTA in Paris at the 6th Global Congress and to participate in INTA programs in India, Brussels, and Puerto Rico, and that was just in the first quarter of the year. Gerhard has provided incisive comments and quick turnaround on a large number of INTA submissions and has led a very effective team of officers. Involved in numerous organizations and initiatives, he has been an outstanding ambassador for INTA. He and I have a weekly call at 4 p.m., but that's my time, 10 p.m. in Stuttgart, and Gerhard is just getting home. Amid all the pressures of a fast-paced IP practice, and that includes tearing down the Autobahn at speeds American drivers can only dream of, <laughs> he has performed his INTA duties with grace and good humor. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to present your 2011 president, Gerhard Bauer. Thank you, Alan, for your kind words of introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to INTA's 133rd annual meeting here in San Francisco. Thank you all for joining us this year. It is an honor for me to address such a distinguished audience. I would like to join Al in thanking the 2011 Annual Meeting Project Team, especially this year's co-chairs Dana Gillen and Max Kingeldine. We appreciate the planning that took place before this event. I also want to acknowledge the INTA staff's stupendous job on this annual meeting. Coordinating a big event like this is not easy. We recognize your hard work and the time spent in organizing this for the trademark community. Here we are again together at the world's largest event for trademark professionals. It has been one year since we last met in Boston to celebrate trademarks. Now, one year later, we are in another annual meeting, sitting side by side. I see familiar faces but I am pleased to see that there are new ones too. We attend the annual meeting to capitalize on the networking opportunities this event has to offer. The people we meet and the contacts we make at the annual meeting are comparable to none. And while we are here to advance the interests of our companies and clients, we find that we develop our own professional careers and make friends along the way. And where there are friends, there's also a lot of fun. I hope you can enjoy the meeting. Let me tell you about one of my own personal annual meeting experiences. On my screen, it tells me, tell the subway story. So you will be amazed what a subway story is. The subway story happened back in 2008 during the annual meeting in Berlin. The then Vice President of the Association, who happens to be myself, and my esteemed Executive Director, Alan Drusen, who are sitting in the Berlin subway, returning from the conference center to the city center and the hotels. While we are sitting and chatting to each other, because we were friends at this time already, I was realizing that a young lady was looking at me. In fact, she was not looking at me, she was looking at the badge I wore at that time. And she said, are you the Mr. Bauer I'm communicating with? Okay. <laughs> I was a little amazed, but then I found out, yes, this was the lady I was communicating with, because we have been in written contact with respect to a trademark license agreement. And now we met in the subway in Berlin. You can imagine how much easier it was to conclude this contract, to bring it to a, a successful end. And now we meet again every year uh, during the annual meeting. I hope you experience a similar positive experience as I did at that time. New faces, new friends, and of course, we find ourselves in a new city. Today we are in San Francisco, the epicenter of innovation and entrepreneurship. 
a forward-thinking area. Everything around us is evidence of new brands being born. We are in close proximity to Silicon Valley, where technology companies are pushing boundaries in how we live our everyday lives. We are here in SOMA, the part of San Francisco where residents create cutting-edge designs for the urban lifestyle. And lastly, we are a short drive to Napa Valley where vineyards experiment with new techniques for making wine. And they do very successfully, as I experienced last week. <laughs> In San Francisco, we get a peek at what the rest of the world will have and will consume tomorrow. This city reminds us of the important beginnings of a brand story, where businesses work hard to make a name for themselves. And thus, it is a reminder of why trademarks and the protection of, tra of brands and trademarks are so important. But as much as San Francisco displays brands of tomorrow, the city has an important place in history too. Soon after the population exploded as a result of the gold rush, entrepreneurs, bankers and other merchants settled in the city. Even in the past, the city promised rich opportunities to those looking to do business. This same promise attracted immigrants from all over the world, especially from Asia. Now, the city boasts a population with diverse backgrounds. Each group has its own culture, views and ideas that contribute to the city's vibrant and innovative business community. To me, it is only fitting that the annual meeting is located here in San Francisco. Look around us in this room. Like San Francisco, we are a diverse group. We come from many different places, we speak many languages, and we represent many industries. Yet, during the next few days, we convene to learn, to collaborate, and to share with one another. We meet year after year because, let's face it, we all have the same goals. To protect brands, to help consumers identify the real source of their goods. That is, to promote trademarks. While we appear to be different on the surface, our common goals make us a strong coalition. We are what makes the International Trademark Association. Since its founding, INTA has reflected the changing world of trademarks. As globalization has risen, so has INTA, its membership and its work. INTA's board of directors, for example, hail from around the world. Australia, Bahrain, Germany, Italy, Malaysia, the Netherlands, People's Republic of China, South Africa, the United Kingdom, and of course, the United States. Evidence of our work to promote trademarks and advance the trademark industry can be found in all regions of this world. Last February, we had our first government relations program in India where we met with key representatives from the country's trademark office. This is the first of many significant steps in building a strong relationship with the office and ensuring that trademark owners' views are heard. We continue to send delegations of US and European brand owners to China each year. While there, we meet with government officials and Chinese enterprises. As a result of our efforts, INTA has increased in its communications with the Chinese government and conducted useful information exchanges with brand owners. Plans are underway for INTA's annual meeting in Hong Kong, which will take place three years from now. This is a milestone for the association and for trademarks, as this will be the first time that the industry's largest event will be hosted in Asia. We hope that each of you will join us then. On the other side of the world, I'm pleased to report that INTA has strengthened its presence in Europe. INTA remains as one of the accredited observers at OHIM's Administrative Board and Budget Committee. And thanks to the strong leadership of OHIM's new president, Antonio Campinos, who is with us here today, the two organizations continue their partnership in promoting the use of community trademarks in Europe. 
our work with other European users groups, AAM, Business Europe, ECTA and MARCS, has allowed the association to effectively represent brand owners' concerns and views to the European Commission, OHIM and the national trademark offices. Lastly, we joined forces with GRUA, the German Association for the Protection of Intellectual Property, to address anti-IP sentiments in Europe through a program in Brussels last February. In Latin America, INTA made progress in encouraging uniformity within the country's trademark offices and their examination procedures. In the past, INTA held successful government training programs for examiners in Argentina, Brazil and Uruguay. I myself participated in the most recent training program which took place in March, where government officials from Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic and Anguilla attended. This session gave INTA the opportunity to recommend ways to increase consistency on classification issues, oppositions and cancellations regarding the registration of trademarks. Also, while being in Puerto Rico, was INTA's joint program with ACP, which discussed the interesting topic of trademarks in the sports and entertainment industries. INTA's global membership and work have encouraged countries to recognize the importance of trademarks in business. Yet, our work is not finished here. Important trademark issues remain in which INTA has and will continue to provide expertise and guidance. I would likely, like to briefly address three of these issues. Counterfeiting, the European trademark systems and ICANN's plans to introduce an unlimited number of new generic top-level domains on the Internet. These three issues were large topics of discussion during last year's annual meeting and since then there have been significant developments. The first item I'll address is counterfeiting. We know that counterfeiting is a massive global problem. By 2015, it is projected to be a $1.75 trillion problem. It affects 2 million good and honest jobs each year. As large and daunting a task like fighting counterfeiting may seem, we must not lose patience. Global brand protection takes coordination, partnerships and a consistent effort from all brand owners. With our collective efforts, the trademark industry can help protect legitimate businesses and consumers from the negative effects of the crime. <coughs> I represented INTE at the Global Congress on Combating Counterfeiting and Piracy in February in Paris. There, intergovernmental organizations like the World Intellectual Property Organization, the World Customs Organization, as well as Interpol, allied with INTA and other industry organizations. We discussed the need to build respect for intellectual property in a balanced and sustainable way and considered the overlapping social and economic effects of counterfeiting. While there, INTA, along with the International Chamber of Commerce's BESCAP, led a leader summit with the Business Response Group, a group of national and international industry associations. The group's unified efforts were instrumental when presenting the views of brand owners to the negotiating countries of the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, or ECTA. If signed, ECTA will be the first international agreement designed specifically to combat counterfeiting and piracy in a harmonized way. On December 20, 2010, the negotiators released the finalized text of the agreement. The participating countries are currently reviewing the agreement and proceeding with their respective internal review processes. We urge the negotiating countries to sign ACTA. They must show the rest of the world that counterfeiting and piracy are serious problems that governments are willing to address through coordination and increased enforcement. 
INTA will continue to follow ACTA's progress in each of the negotiating countries and work with other committed organizations to show strong industry support. And now, we come to our second issue, the European Union Trademark System Study. The last time we saw each other, the Max Planck Institute was in the midst of conducting a study of the European trademark systems after securing the contract from the European Commission. The results of the study, while not binding on the Commission, can be a roadmap for greater consistency, convergence and harmonization in the European trademark system. INTA was actively involved with this issue from the moment it was announced. The association conducted its own internal review on the various topics. We met with the Max Planck Institute last June to share our initial views and positions. Our final report was sent to the Max Planck Institute and the European Commission for review last November and it's now available on the INTA website. The results of Max Planck Institute's study were revealed to the public in March of this year. At this time, INTA quickly engaged our working groups to closely analyze the study's recommendations in comparison to INTA's views. We met with representatives of the European Commission last month and will continue to communicate with the Commission, OHIM and other users groups to ensure that our members' concerns and recommendations are considered during the review process which is expected to lead to a legislative proposal from the Commission in October. Updating the European trademark systems and its key pieces of legislation, the trademark directive and the community trademark regulation, is a sizable task for the European Commission. But it is one that is very necessary considering the dramatic development of the systems in recent years. We command the Commission for taking the initiative to review and modernize the systems and we will continue to offer our expertise and recommendations on this matter. And finally, we come to our last issue, the proposed introduction of an unlimited number of new GTLDs to the Internet. While I have reflected on how far we have come from a year ago, this issue in particular is a reminder of the challenges and work that lie ahead. ICANN, the organization that manages the Internet's domain name system, hopes to launch its process for introducing new GTLDs at its June public meeting in Singapore. This goal was set in place in spite of the concerns raised by INTA and many others including ICANN's own Government Advisory Committee. As ICANN is set on launching its new GTLD program at the earliest possible date, INTA remains committed to ensuring the most adequate protection for trademarks and consumers. In the current system of nearly 300 top-level domain names, brand owners are monitoring registering and enforcing their trademarks in over a thousand different extensions. The introduction of large numbers of new GTLDs will surely add to these complexities as well as costs. It will raise new and unforeseen challenges for trademark owners seeking to maintain the integrity of their brands and for consumers relying on the internet for safe, secure and accurate searches. This is exactly why we continue to urge ICANN to reassess its strategy, to manage the domain name system in a more accountable and transparent manner, to produce results more attuned to serving the public's interest, including the interest of trademark owners from every corner of the world. INTA has been actively engaged with ICANN and will continue to advance policies that strengthen trademarks while promoting internet stability and security. Earlier this month, INTA testified before the US House of Representatives at the ICANN generic top-level domain oversight hearing. 
And on Saturday, as Alan noted earlier, we submitted detailed comments and recommendations on the latest version of ICANN's applicant guidebook for new GTLDs. Members of INTA's Internet Committee and staff have been a regular presence at ICANN's meetings, participating in work groups and on committees, and we have diligently followed up with the organizations through our comments, recommendations and letters. We also recognize that if and when new GTLDs are introduced, companies must be prepared. A special session on the proposed new GTLDs at this year's annual meeting is one of the many ways INTA is supporting and informing its members of this important development. I encourage you to take advantage of these resources. Regardless of the challenges that lie ahead, we must not lose sight of the fact that without trademark protection, the relationship that brands build with their customers would be in peril. Any weakening of trademark rights would jeopardize the trust that the public develop in your clients' products and services. And ultimately, it would undermine the hard work represented, for example, by the entrepreneurs and innovators here in San Francisco. The company of this year's keynote speaker, John Anderson of Levi Strauss and Co., is a perfect example of an innovation that has evolved to become an historic brand. Established right here in San Francisco, the company has been developing its brands and its customer base for more than a century. I hope you will enjoy his speech as well as this year's program. Vielen Dank, dass Sie die Zeit nicht gescheut haben, heute hier zu sein und am 133. Jahrestreffen von INTA teilzunehmen. Ich wünsche Ihnen allen eine erfolgreiche und erfreuliche Woche. And in English, thank you very much for your time and for coming to INTA's 133rd annual meeting. I wish you a successful and enjoyable week. Thank you. Sollte ich auch Deutsch sprechen? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Each year in May, for the past 133 years, bird watches worldwide have recorded a strange migration movement. Uh, first a few, but now thousands of some interesting species, including the common brand piper, the renewal turn and uh, also the legal eagle, just to name a few to a single spot in the world. And when all the migrants have finally settled down and are flocking together as birds of a feather do, they start talking to each other. What do they talk about? Trademarks. This year San Francisco has been chosen as the destination for migration, and uh, so here we are. I'm Max Kinkeldeit, partner at the Grüniger Law Firm in Munich, Germany, and co-chair of this year's annual meeting. On behalf of my co-chair, Dana Gilland, Vice President and Assistant General Counsel of IP at Diageo North America, Inc., I would like to welcome you all to the International Trademark Association's 133rd annual meeting. Dana has unfortunately not been able to travel, but uh, sends all of you her regards and best wishes for a successful conference. I hope you already had a great start into this meeting and were able to enjoy a little bit of the amazing, but uh, I must admit, chilly city of San Francisco, <laughs> with its particular sights and vibrant neighborhoods. This is actually the sixth time that INTA has come to San Francisco. In May 1968, when ITA was still called USTA, the annual meeting for the first time on the West Coast took place at the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco with only 543 participants. Believe it or not, look at this crowd, 543, that's how it started in 1968. Since then, the annual meetings were held in San Francisco in 1977 with already almost a thousand attendees. And um, at that time, for the first time, 224 delegates and friends from outside the US. Then again in 1981 and 1991, uh, with a growing number of attendees and uh, at last in 2001 and there we had already almost 7,000 attendees. This year at our 133rd annual meeting I'm pleased to report uh, as Alan already mentioned earlier 
that we have an impressive pre-registration of 8,700 attendees and expect the number to grow possibly into the 9,000s. Now, particularly for young practitioners who are attending the meeting for the first time, it is not always easy to navigate through a huge crowd such as this one. Therefore, I would like to provide some guidance and highlight some of the great opportunities this year's inter-annual meeting provides. Firstly, I would like to introduce you to the program we've put together for you. We have made sure that there is something interesting in it for everyone. Dana and I decided not to go for a specific theme. Uh, there's so much to cover here in San Francisco. But um, we wanted to put the spotlight on trademark law related issues from many different perspectives. And we'll also present some really interesting but not strictly trademark law related topics. There will, for example, be a conversation between brand owners, retailers, and manufacturers about private labels in the US. We will provide um, regional updates for East Asia, Europe, the Middle East, India, and Pakistan. There will be an industry breakout session on design protection in the fashion industry, and a session on ambush marketing and the protection of athlete names and images in sports. My personal favorite will be a workshop on effective oral presentations. But, but I would also like to specifically draw your attention to a session where renowned panelists will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Trademark Reporter, looking back on a century of trademark law moderated by Professor J. Thomas McCarthy of the University of San Francisco School of Law. Please also sign up for one of over 190 table topics where attendees will discuss interesting trademark-related topics in small groups giving each attendee the chance to participate in a lively discussion. Some tickets are still available and you can stop by registration at the first level to purchase one. I would also like to point your attention to the exhibition hall this year featuring 117 exhibitors. Feel free to stop by the Inter booth at booth 501 to meet the staff, learn more about the resources available to members and get answers to all your interrelated questions. Be sure to take advantage of the new speed networking opportunity in the back of the exhibition hall. Speed networking is a fun and effective way to make a lot of initial connections in a very different environment from the standard business networking meetings. Each participant will have the chance to spend five minutes with every other participant to chat, make a connection, exchange business cards, of course, and then move on to the next colleague. Although it's, certain, it's currently sold out, stop by one of, before one of the sessions and see if there's been a cancellation. And also don't forget to download Inta's annual meeting mobile app. It's available for download to iPhone, Droid, and Blackberry, or you can use the web-enabled mobile sites. The app gives you access to the meeting schedule, floor plans, exhibitor and sponsor info, information about San Francisco, and so much more. Another new feature this year is Inta TV, providing daily highlights of annual meeting sessions and events and interviews with leaders of Inta and the trademark community. You can watch Inta TV on the web at the Inta homepage or on YouTube, or if you're staying at an official Inta hotel, you can also watch Inta TV from the comfort of your hotel room. Uh, please check the front desk uh, to get the channel number for your hotel, and I promise it won't show up in your bill. <laughs> Further, I would like to highlight the annual meetings art exhibit. Over 40 artists from around the world have participated this year and submitted works of art to include photography, drawings, painting, and jewelry. Please take a few minutes, as I did last year and also this year. Yesterday I took a couple minutes and uh, took a look at the art exhibit. Um, it's located on the second level of the foyer and uh, please take the chance to escape the buzz of the inter-annual meeting for a couple of minutes and discover the secret talents of your inter colleagues. Last but not least, I would like to make you aware of the following link. Carol Smith from Hiring Smith LP has put together a list of extremely helpful information about San Francisco and the Bay Area in general, which will allow you to all to make the most of your stay in San Francisco. You can find this list in the attendee portal and the annual meeting website. Now, none of this program would have come together without the heart and dedicated work of a wonderful group of volunteers who have been planning this meeting for over two years now. Dana and I would like to thank them all for the incredible amount of volunteer time they invested. The team leaders are David Stone on international programming, Dan Glazer on US programming, 
Renee Simonton and Rod Enns on industry breakouts, Peter Chalk on regional updates, Jim McCarthy on workshops, Helen Minsker on table topics, Carol Smith on San Francisco information. We would also like to thank the many members of the project team who organized speakers, developed the many sessions over the next few days and helped create this great program. Over the past two years, the team members have participated on numerous conference calls, in-person meetings, and attended to hundreds of emails as they pulled together a diverse group of topics and speakers for a mixed audience. In the end, the team developed 33 sessions of varying education levels, offering attendees many options for filling their meeting schedule and earning CLE and CPD credits. And last but not least, Dana and I would like to thank our inter-staff liaison, and here in particular, Sarah Burke O'Connell. Without Sarah's dedication, perseverance, and patience, particularly patience with Dana and myself, all of this would not have been possible. Thank you so much. Also, a really big thank you to Trisha Simpson for organizing the logistics of the entire week. This morning, we are extremely fortunate to have John Anderson, President and CEO of Levi Strauss & Co. with us as our keynote speaker. John is an accomplished executive who has established a 30-year record of outstanding achievement at Levi Strauss & Co. He has extensive management experience with the Levi Strauss brands around the world and is a dynamic leader with wide-ranging experience in merchandising, marketing, and operations. We are very happy that John accepted our invitation to give the keynote speech at this year's meeting. As you know, Levi Strauss & Co. is headquartered in San Francisco, and I cannot imagine anyone better suited to speak to us today than John. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to John Anderson. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you a little bit about the history of Levi Strauss & Co. Um, last night I had the opportunity to meet some of you at the Levi's store on Union Square. For those of you that couldn't make it, I can't think of a better moment that you can bring back from San Francisco, <laughs> the number one jean brand from the house of Strauss where Levi's was invented. So please take advantage of enjoying our city and more importantly, take home some of our great products. <laughs> Thinking about our brands, how to protect them, elevate and spread them around the world, is something that we are vigilant about at Levi Strauss & Company. So I'd like to start with a frank admission. It's no easy business maintaining global brands. And it's even more difficult to keep a brand relevant while staying loyal to its roots. Good brands always benefit from a strong history, of course, but brands are also organic. They live and die based on their relevance to what's happening now with the culture, competitors and consumers. And staying relevant is hard, constant work. Add a counterfeit industry that is growing in strength and sophistication. Throw in fierce competitors, each with their own strengths. Put into the mix a global economic crisis and a planet that needs green, sustainable businesses. What you get when you add it all together is a tremendous challenge. One that requires more work, integrity and innovation than ever before. In the midst of all of this, I'm pleased to say the brands of Levi Strauss and Company not only endure but get stronger, especially over the last decade. None of our success on this front has been accidental or pure good luck. Our brand strategy has been a conscious, careful effort played out over our history. That strategy and what we've learned from the process is my topic today. Specifically, I'd like to talk about three things. Three things that have gotten us where we are and that will guide us as we move forward. First, I want to talk about authenticity and how authenticity is critical to a brand's success. The lawyers in the room probably want me to say that a brand is a complex set of laws and trademarks, and they may be right, in part. 
Yet, as I'll explain, an inauthentic brand cannot stand the test of time and it cannot thrive in a global economy. Second, I want to discuss iconography. In an industry filled with imitation and a world where intellectual property is constantly under threat, a brand cannot survive merely as an idea. Rather, it's a name and a visual aesthetic and a symbol of values and principles. And finally, I want to talk about innovation. People tend to think that brands are fixed ideas. In fact, creative brands have to introduce new ideas constantly. Certainly no American brand can expect to survive globally by resting on its history. The associations a brand may enjoy at home may not translate abroad, and brands need to develop in new markets in order to survive. I'll try to avoid talking too much about the legal details of our trademarks and our brands. I really don't want you to feel as though you're at work here this morning. Instead, I'd rather tell you a story that will shed some light on what have made our brands at Levi Strauss & Co. so evocative, and how they're being rediscovered around the world. It's taken almost a century and a half to get here, and despite some setbacks, we're thrilled to be where we are today. Let's start with authenticity. A company can have a trademark, a logo, a product line, and a marketing plan. But without authenticity, it will not have an honest, enduring brand. For us, authenticity comes down to three simple questions. Do your business practices have the same integrity as your products? Do you conduct your business in a way that clearly reflects a consistent set of values? And do you pursue profit with principles? These questions aren't a matter of market research or advertising. All of us who work at Levi Strauss & Co. have arrived at a company with a very rich legacy. To be authentic is to live up to that legacy. Ours is more than just being a company that invented the blue jean. It's that, of course, but also how we've done business over the past century and a half. Many of you may be familiar with our history. From the beginning in San Francisco, more than 150 years ago, our founder always believed that a company had to act in a way that made a difference to the communities in which we worked. Levi Strauss himself made generous donations to a local orphanage and set up a scholarship fund for both men and women. In 1906, an earthquake raised our San Francisco factory and brought business to a standstill. But the company's employees, each and every one, received their pay while the factory was being rebuilt. This is a vision of how our company ought to behave, and it has been with us ever since. In the era of segregation, we opened our factories to African-American workers, even in the South. In the wake of the HIV AIDS epidemic, we were among the first companies to institute an education program for our workers. In 1992, we were the first Fortune 500 company to offer benefits to same-sex partners. And we were the first company to establish a formal terms of engagement for our factories around the world. These standards help ensure that the people who make our product treated fairly and ethically. In fact, just last week, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of our terms of engagement by proposing the next evolution of our policies, to raise the bar again to improve workers' lives around the world. None of these efforts is a special initiative or a once-a-year charity project. The company introduced a new style of clothing to America, and since then, we've always thought of ourselves as pioneers. Pioneers in what we made, pioneers in how we act. It is that legacy and our consistent efforts to build upon it that gives our brand authenticity. Today, when we build a green headquarters or educate consumers about washing their jeans less to save waters, or introduce HIV prevention programs in our factories, we see these steps 
as integral part of what Levi Strauss and company does. That's what authenticity means. Consumers and business partners see it right away. They understand that we are a commercial enterprise, but they also recognise that we have a set of principles that guide our business. I think it's what keep our brands fresh, relevant and distinct. Unfortunately, however, authenticity is not enough. Every global brand needs not just the social responsibility, but the captivating iconography recognised the world over. That leads me to my second point, creating iconography. Developing it and supporting it has been a conscious and carefully planned component of our strategy. We view our icons not just as a form of marketing, but as a critical piece of brand protection. In fact, it is a response to a very old problem. Today, denim jeans are the most popular clothing item in the world. We invented the category, popularised it, stylised it, and helped transition it from workwear to everyday casual clothing. The very first pair was marketed in 1873, and we received a patent shortly thereafter. This gave Levi Strauss and Co. the exclusive right to manufacture what was then called riveted clothing. The patent, however, was only good for 17 years. When it expired, we anticipated a flood of competition that would mimic our brand and make it difficult for consumers to identify the original Levi's jeans. To stay ahead, we created the unique back pocket stitching design in 1873 and the two horse logo in 1886. Both the stitching and the logo provided images consumers could associate with the original Levi's jeans before the market became swamped with imitators. And the shapes and pictures of those two icons were critically important. With a diverse consumer base, many of whom were illiterate or could speak no English, we wanted icons that would communicate without language. Unfortunately,